Coglet, how long before ChatGPT takes my job? When I was a kid, there were two topics that dominated my imagination. Number one was robots, you probably guessed. Number two was virtual pet simulators. I'm talking Tamagotchi, the Chow Garden and Creatures. In today's world of investor bait humanoid bots and lifeless AI slop, I set out to make a companion robot with personality and character, and maybe even fulfill my childhood dream of having a pet robot. This project was made possible with JLC PCB. Starting from simple development boards, jumper wires and breadboards, JLC has enabled me to bring these bird's nests to compact, efficient and sleek PCBs quickly and easily. I can find any component I need in JLC's library of almost 7 million parts, import these straight into Easy EDA with the footprints and schematics already built in, and then quickly whip up a board in any colour, thickness, weight, or any other specification I want, even full colour graphical printing. Right now, JLC PCB have an offer on flexible PCBs. Whether for wearables, medical devices, or IoT applications, their FPCs reduce space and weight while staying super reliable. Just upload your Gerber files and get an instant quote. And the best part is FPCs begin at just $2 and now you can claim a $10 coupon to try them out. Check my links below to get the coupon and try out flexible PCBs from JLC PCB today. So where to start with my design? Well there's a theme with this one and the theme is gears. A lot of my animatronic designs mainly rely on linkages to drive motion. They're convenient for transmitting some force across a long distance with awkward angles but making 3D printed skinny levers with robust pivots can be difficult and I always try to steer clear of less accessible methods like machining or laser cutting so that these projects can be accessible to as many makers as possible. Enter the humble gear. Using gears I can attach one directly to the motor and the other directly to the part I'm moving so I only need to design one big solid pivot rather than multiple small and flimsy ones. There's another special feature of these gears, and that's that they're herringbone gears or double helical, meaning the teeth are in a V pattern rather than being straight. Straight gears would have worked, but they can easily move sideways and get misaligned. Sometimes this is a good design feature, but with a project like this, I'm concerned about the stack up of lots of little gaps, tolerances, and imperfections in the 3D printed parts. And I want my gears to be locked in perfect alignment. I also know that none of the forces I'm concerned with here are strong enough to cause any binding or wearing if the gears are too far out of alignment. Herringbone gears are like a pair of helical gears mirrored down the middle. The left side helical gears produce a force which pushes the gear in one direction and the right side pushes it in the opposite direction. The result is that the net force on the servo motor, the housing and the pivot point is zero. The forces cancel each other out but the gears get held in perfect alignment because of these forces pushing against each other evenly. Also, come on guys, they look a lot cooler. The next issue was that I found myself in gear hell. I wanted to push the limits of how much actuation I could fit in a tight space and at the same time keep all of the components bulky and tactile enough to assemble easily. I was having this knock-on effect where every little change I made affected all of the placements of the gears and the motors around it and I was stuck in this phase fighting back and forth for a few millimeters here and there for a good few days. What really helped was to plan out all of the gear paths with simple master sketches first and try not to get bogged down in details until later on. One quirky detail which made me a lot of extra space is that I ended up placing the motor for the mouth really far back in the head with a lever that spans the whole depth because I only needed about 25 degrees of movement to open the mouth so I could use a big gear reduction and save space in the centre of the head. I built a frame to link everything together, consisting of two parts linked by some snap fit standoffs. And I also designed a neck and a body to house the electronics and some wheels. I think I have a knack for designing scary, disturbing and uncanny robots, but I also think it's easier to make something scary than it is to make something friendly. So this time what I really wanted to do is try making something with personality and approachability. I was inspired by Jorvan Moss, seeing his companion robots made me want to start this project in the first place, but I also really admire that he can blend design styles. A lot of his projects have this retro-futuristic kind of NASA punk style, but they still come out looking friendly and cute without really having any human or organic elements. So I wanted to commit to a solid design identity. I like big primary forms and strong silhouettes and this Y2K bubbly kind of aesthetic, which is probably burned into my brain from too many hours in the chow garden. So this is the result. I really like this design, but I think a lot of people will say that the realistic eyes are just a little bit too creepy. 
But to be honest, I just can't help myself. I think that if my design can teeter just on the edge of the uncanny valley, then it's been a success in my eyes. The next key to a design with personality and character is animation. These things have made people like me very lazy. In the majority of robotics applications, you will have a motor and an encoder, and you'll need some kind of feedback loop to control and monitor the acceleration and speed of the motor in relation to the measured resulting motion. But these hobby servos take away all of that control logic and simplify movement to just a single position command from zero to 180 degrees. For my eye mechanisms, this motion looks realistic because eye movements and blinking are very rapid and jerky anyway. But for everything else the body does, we're going to need some easing. Easing is especially important for this project in particular, since the servos are quite small and some of them are moving large loads with big gear reductions. Even though the gearing system amplifies the torque the motor can produce, there's still a lot of weight and therefore inertia in the system overall. And if you try to instantly go from zero to full speed, then all of that inertia is resisting the change, which can put a lot of stress on the motor and gears. In the past, I've done servo easing in kind of janky ways. So this time I decided to do it properly and I wrote my own servo class, which tracks acceleration, speed and position to control the servos smoothly. And rather than writing commands to the servos as and when I need them to change, every single loop I instruct all servos to check and update their positions. What this all means is that one, I have a server management system which runs separately to any other code, so I can run multiple processes at once. And two, server targets, speeds and accelerations are being constantly tracked. So if, for example, my neck is running full speed in one direction and I tell it to go back to the other side, it won't stop dead and risk damaging the drive system. It will continue on its original trajectory, gradually slowing down according to an acceleration factor I specify, and then accelerate in the opposite direction and smoothly move to its new target. It's very protective, but it also looks much more natural. And for rapid moving parts like the eyes, I can just set the acceleration really high to make the movements more snappy. And in case you're wondering, the PCB I'm prototyping with is a modified version of the mouth board, which I use on my robotic head project, driven by a Raspberry Pi Pico and manufactured by JLC PCB. <laughs> The final part of building the personality is posing and animation. At this stage I had in mind that the robot would perform a few pretty basic tasks, being idle, listening and talking. This is definitely something I think I'll revisit as the project progresses, so for now I made the animations with simple loops. For example, the ears are moving towards a particular target until the timer reaches zero and then the target switches to the opposite direction. Very simple stuff, but I programmed these animations essentially as states. So I can command the robot to be in the idle state, and then I can command the robot to be in the talking state, and it will keep jabbering away even though the loop is still repeating, and it's still listening out for new commands. This was all starting to look really nice, so the next thing for me to think about was the scary part. What does this robot actually do, and how is it controlled? But before confronting that and other scary topics like ethics, climate change, capitalism and the erosion of the middle class, I wanted to see if I could recreate my last project by putting cameras inside the eyes of this new bot and have it track my face as I move around. This time I used one of my realistic eyes and dremeled out a space for the camera behind the pupil. It's not very optically clear right now. The image is pretty blurry. First off, I thought if I filled the whole cavity with resin so there would be no air gap between the lens and the cornea, that might help, but it appeared to actually make things worse. The issue turned out to be that the camera was trying to focus on the back of the eyeball, super close up. So by using fixed focus lenses, I think I can get a much clearer image. Right now you can buy this micro camera on nmrobots.com and I'm starting to take pre-orders of the super realistic camera compatible eyes. This is really fun to play with now because the wheels give it that extra range of motion and it's starting to feel like it has a life of its own. So AI then. I spend a lot of time thinking about AI but I don't have a particularly strong opinion about it. It has the capacity to do tremendous harm and the capacity to do tremendous good. But let's be honest, most of the ways it's implemented in every app, website or product recently is just kind of useless and annoying. The best thing we can do is to be educated, learn about how the technology works, the good parts and the bad, and work towards open source and democratization of tech. Now I could just plug this whole thing into ChatGPT, and let's be honest, it would work great, but I wanted to learn more about language models and machine learning, and so I sought to install my own local version of an AI chatbot that would run without an internet connection. Using Hugging Faces Transformers library, I was able to run a small open source model from inside a Python script running on a Raspberry Pi 4. So what can this do? Well, let's ask. 
Coglet, what types of tasks can you perform? Coglet can perform the following tasks. Coglet, what is the boiling point of water? Boiling point is the temperature at which water boils. What temperature does water boil? Water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. What is that in Celsius? Celsius. What is the boiling point of water in Celsius? The boiling point of water in Celsius is 212 degrees Celsius. Okay, so it's not perfect. The model I'm using here is Flan T5, which is an open source research model trained by Google. And that's because I just tried a few different ones and this one had a good balance of decent responses and fast response time. And I needed something small enough that I could put on a Raspberry Pi. I think it's important to point out that most small voice assistants like Alexa, Google Nest and Siri aren't actually powered by large scale AI language models. At least they haven't been until very recently. Traditionally, they've relied on speech recognition to turn your voice into text and then machine learning classifiers to figure out what category your command falls into like set a timer, clear music, or turn on the lights. Each of those categories is tied to a set of predefined actions and responses. That setup gives you the illusion of talking to an intelligent agent, but really it's just matching your words to one of many pre-programmed templates. By contrast, Coglet is based on a general purpose language model. Instead of just picking from a fixed list, it can theoretically generate responses across a much broader range of topics because it's trained on patterns of language itself, not just a narrow set of commands. Coglet, ask me a question. Answer, what is the best way to get a job in New York City? So finally, just to prove that I could, even though the project is in quite an early stage of development, I ran everything locally and simultaneously using a battery. So that's the Raspberry Pi coordinating all of the AI responses, camera face tracking and all of the movement control. I had to fatten Coglet up a bit to fit the Raspberry Pi in the base and then I completely forgot to leave space for the USB cables so I had to make him even bigger and since I didn't have time to buy short cables or figure out any of the placement or anything like that for something I'd be changing later anyway I just kind of let the remaining cables hang out the back. This is just a proof of concept after all. I also had to lobotomize poor Coglet in order to get the AI model to respond at a reasonable speed on the Raspberry Pi so I switched from the Flan T5 large model to the Flan T5 small model and this significantly degraded the quality of the responses. Coglet, what colour is the sky? The sky is brown. What colour is mud? Color of mud is brown. What color is a leaf? Color of a leaf is brown. How many continents are there on Earth? Two. Coglet, why are you being silly? So I think that a locally running model is unfortunately just not going to be an option for the future of this project. Connecting to some kind of server will allow me to use a way compact stack of control boards and the responses and abilities will be drastically better. I just want to figure out the most ethical way to do so before I publish the final open source version of this project. If it is going to be an online service, I want to find one which cares about fair use of training data and using energy responsibly. So this project is in development still. So if you can't wait for my eventual free and open source release, you can get access to the code and CAD files for this project and all of my other projects that I've worked on by joining my Patreon page. I'm also looking for beta testers to try out some of my 3D printed designs before I release them publicly. So if you're interested in helping me out, check the Google form in the description. As I mentioned, you can buy cameras to use in simple hollow versions of my eyes, or you can now pre-order my realistic camera compatible eyeballs on nmrobots.com. And those will work in my regular eye mechanism, my previous head tracking robot, and Coglet when he's ready. A massive thank you to all of my patrons as always, and I'll see you guys next time.